We are here with Dr. Steven Siegel, the Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and the Behavioral Sciences at Keck School of Medicine of USC and the Chief Mental Health and Wellness Officer at the Keck Medicine of USC to talk about how health systems can reduce stress among healthcare teams and other employees. Hi, Dr. Siegel. Thank you for joining us here. Would you please describe the Care for the Caregiver program you have at USC? Certainly, and thank you for having me here this morning. At USC, in our health system, we've enacted a large program called Care for the Caregiver with a mission to reduce burnout and stress by increasing support systems, improving efficacy and, and efficiency across all people who work in our health system. So for example, we have services that are available to the clinicians, whether those be physicians, nurses, or various types of technicians or therapists. But we also offer services to our EVS workers, our front desk staff, because we recognize and believe that all people who work in health systems impact patient care and are impacted by the stresses of clinical environments. We have many different facets to the program that range from an emotional support line where people can call in and just have free confidential counseling for an issue or topic in their lives. We have peer supporters where it's not a trained therapist, but now it's someone like you who walks in your shoes, who's been trained to help with situational challenges. We offer support sessions, trainings, we give massages and we offer grants and gifts to help people through financial difficulties that arise over the course of their careers. Dr. Stingle, this is amazing. What led you and your colleagues at USC to develop this program? So it started back in 2018 with just a concept with a few of us sitting around thinking, what, what could we do to help people who seem to be increasingly challenged by the stresses of healthcare? So it was a very organic concept. But in those early days, we didn't have a sense of how we were going to pay for that. However, once the pandemic really hit, the health system pivoted and came back to our small group and asked if we could just launch immediately to attend to these extraordinary needs of our health system workers under the, the weight of COVID. And so, as an example, the Department of Psychiatry took 70 of our faculty members overnight and train them to staff a 24-7, 365 mm -hmm. emotional support line. We gave free bona fide mental health care, so therapy or psychiatry to anyone who needed it or their families. With support from the university and the health system, we worked with our law school to offer free law consultation because we had healthcare workers. And it's hard to remember this now, but in the early days of the pandemic, people would come to work not fully knowing if they would be able to go back home because of the mortality rate. So we gave out free wills so that healthcare workers and people in hospitals could, could have a will. We also, with university support, offered hundreds, I mean, eventually thousands of free nights in hotels for people who could come to work, do their shift, and then stay in a hotel for fear of bringing COVID home. So there was a host of these kinds of, of services all built around supporting people through COVID. But in 2021, 
after the vaccines, after it became less of a, a day-to-day life and death struggle and more of a an ongoing situation like now, the university actually decided this had been such an important program that they started the Care for the Caregiver office, not just a program, appointed me as the inaugural chief mental health and wellness officer and turned to both philanthropy and working with our insurance carrier who underwrites the program to a small extent because of their recognition that if we can reduce stress and burnout, people will actually be better clinicians, make fewer mistakes, and ultimately create a safer, better health system by attending to the needs of our workers. And so now we have eight members in our office. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing this uh, Plexus story with us. What do you think are some uh, of the most meaningful interventions that health systems can employ to address clinical burnouts? So I think, you know, I'm sure this will vary from setting to setting and over time. So the first step in answering that question is actually having a meaningful way to solicit and act on feedback. In our system, we use an engagement and culture survey. Uh, There are many, it it doesn't matter which one, there's many good ones out there. And our office care for the caregiver is charged with both disseminating the survey, but then getting the results and working with each academic department. Our HR department works with the um, health system units. And so together we get that feedback determine what are the main stressors in people's lives and then work with them to devise an action plan and assess its efficacy. Over the course of five years of of doing those kinds of surveys and then over the last three years of care for the caregiver being a formal office, we've learned that there are several key domains. Those include helping people manage their own emotional experience, which is why uh, I'm going to describe a a randomized controlled trial that we are performing right now with three active arms and one control arm because we want to understand whether the interventions based on these surveys, right, the problems come from the surveys, the interventions actually change things in the way we hope. So, for example, we have a lot of feedback that people just feel burned out. They feel exhausted. They feel that they don't have the the kind of efficacy and, and voice in their systems that they would like. And so the first intervention that we are studying is teaching people about the constructs of acceptance commitment therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy two techniques that allow people to interact with their environments in a way that gives them more sense of agency and we don't do therapy on them we teach them the concept so that they can practice it and they can disseminate it to their colleagues The second main area that we learned about through our engagement surveys is that people demonstrate frustration. They experience frustration when they feel like the systems they work in are not responsive or maximally organized for the benefit of the workflows and the patients. And so typically those sorts of concerns might just end at a water cooler conversation. So we teach people formally how to take an idea and vet and enact it as a change in the way the health system addresses things. It it gives them power to not only understand how to make a change, but when they can't make a change, instead of that feeling gratuitous, which is very disheartening, 
they learn why decisions are as they are, and that I think helps their emotional well-being. And then the third major domain that we hear about is just a, a, a frustration with the amount of time people spend having to use the electronic health record. And I would extend that to things like messaging, you know, the, the, the portals. And they say that they spend, you know, 20 or 30 percent of their time doing things that are not really related to their training and, and patient care, but are more about documentation and insurance. And, and so we have a program to teach people how to be maximally efficient using the tool they have. So it might be the electronic health record in their specialty, in their environment. And our goal is to make it easier to do those tasks and in fact, to shepherd other solutions into the health system. For example, trying to advocate for the use of now AI scribe tools or message tools that will further decrease the burden on clinicians to be performing tasks that are really separate from their training and their desired activity. So those are just a couple of examples. I will say, even though those are the big ones, there are some small ones that are meaningful. You know, as an example, I mentioned earlier, we have masseuses come in, uh, paid for by philanthropy, uh, and those masseuses give out free massages that rotate around the health system, and people just love that. It helps them feel cared for and valued. So, you know, we sometimes talk about the the pizza and lavender you know, interventions that are, are really, they're not changing you, they're not changing the health system. But as long as they're in addition to the meaningful changes, they also help people just feel cared about. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. These are some wonderful interventions. I'm sure many healthcare systems around the world will be able to use uh, the uh, interventions you shared with them. Thank you for your time and for sharing your experience and expertise with our audience. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And, and I hope that health systems are able to adopt a posture of investing in the well-being of their employees, recognizing that while that has good unto, you know, unto itself, it also has significant impact on improving safety and clinical care. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. And everyone, I hope you enjoyed the interview and have a wonderful day. Thank you, take care. Thanks.